When we see God as He is, and when we when we understand His Word, a lot of times it does leave us speechless, doesn't it? Because this is a this is a good God that we serve. And his word to us is good too. This morning we are going to need to be reminded of that. We're taking a, a quick break from the Sermon on the Mount. A couple of weeks ago, we were talking about Jesus' teaching on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And as we taught through that passage in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verses 30 and 31, what we saw was that Jesus was really teaching his disciples and the religious leaders that they had devalued marriage. They had cheapened marriage. And so a couple of weeks ago, we looked at God's Word, and we, we, we really just wanted to elevate marriage back up to its proper biblical place, right? We said that, that God is the one who designed marriage, and as a result, he's the one who gets to define marriage. And we were reminded that I don't have the right to define marriage, and you don't have the right to define marriage. The Supreme Court doesn't have the right to define marriage. It's God, because he's the one who created it. He came up with the idea. And this week, we're going to take a break from that passage in order to answer some questions about marriage, divorce, and remarriage that Jesus didn't specifically touch on. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And so this morning, we're going to, we're going to answer a lot of the questions that are asked in our culture, especially in the church. Right? We've, we've already elevated marriage. We've seen that marriage is a picture of Jesus' love for the church and of the church's glad submission to Christ as we follow Jesus. And so marriage is not only God's idea, it's also a, a, a gospel illustration. It's a picture for the world. And so husbands, let me remind you, based on our time together a couple of weeks ago, the world should be able to look at your love for your wife and see something of Jesus' love for his people. I mean, that's a weighty thing, man. And wives, let me remind you that the world should be able to look at the way you follow your husband's lead and see something of the way the church is to follow Jesus. And that's a weighty responsibility. And our marriages paint a picture for this world of the gospel. This is a massive deal to God. But we live in a fallen and broken world, and marriages don't always last until death do us part. So what does the Bible have to say about this? Are there ever situations in which it's okay, according to God, to get a divorce? And if it's okay to get a divorce, is there ever a time in Scripture where we are allowed to consider remarriage? <laughs> Or is remarriage just always off the table? And again, these are questions that people have pondered and argued over and debated for a long time, friends. And so we need God's grace as we study together. So will you pray with me before we read our passage? Let's ask God to teach us this morning. We don't want my thoughts and my opinions. We want God to teach us through his word. So pray with me. Father, we, we come before you knowing that your word is good. And that you are good. And so... Lord, as we gather here, we, we are looking to you to guide us this morning. We are looking to your spirit to lead during this time and to take your truth and to make it real in our hearts and in our minds. God, the reality this morning is that none of us has a perfect marriage. None of us has conducted ourselves perfectly. There's only one who is perfect, and his name is Jesus. So God, would you help us remember that, and as we study, God, keep us from the temptation to judge others. God, as we study this morning, may you remind us of your grace and your compassion and your forgiveness through Jesus. We pray that none this morning would hear the word of God and walk out of here feeling shame and condemnation, because for everyone who is in Christ, there is no condemnation. So God, speak through me this morning, I pray. Minister to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to read a bigger section of this passage. Start with me in verse 8. And we're going to read all the way through verse 28. It's a longer section, but it has much to teach us. So verse 8. But I say to the unmarried and to widows, that it is good for them if they remain even as I. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. But to the married I give instructions, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband, but if she does leave, she must remain unmarried, or else be reconciled to her husband, and that the husband should not divorce his wife. But to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband, and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Yet if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this manner let him walk. And so I direct in all the churches. Was any man called when he was already circumcised? He is not to become uncircumcised. Has anyone been called in uncircumcision? He is not to be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. Each man must remain in that condition in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not worry about it. But if you are able also to become free, rather do that. For he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who was called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. Now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give an opinion as one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. I think that this is good in view of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you released from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you marry, you have not sinned, and if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Yet such will have trouble in this life, and I am trying to spare you. So there is a lot in this passage. Let me give you a couple of realities before we dive into what Paul has to teach us. So if you're taking notes, I've got a lot for you this morning. Let me give you the first thing you can write down. Here's the first reality we know from Scripture. Sin has tainted the way we view marriage, divorce, and remarriage. I'm going to say that for us again. Sin has tainted the way we view marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Let's be honest about it, friends. We don't view this topic the way that God views this topic. We're going to see that a little bit this morning. And because of our sin nature, we don't see these realities biblically. We see them through this tainted, sinful perspective that throws us off a little bit. And we can actually see this from the beginning of the Bible, right? I mean, think about some of the realities, friends, that we've looked at just the last couple of weeks, right? A couple of weeks ago, we saw in Genesis chapter 1, God created male and female, and he made them in his image. So every single person is made in the image of God. He has stamped us with something of his likeness. And then you get to Genesis chapter 2, and God says, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'm going to make a helper, a companion, a partner suitable for him. And so God fashions Eve out of Adam's ribs, and the two are joined together, and they become one flesh. And that's at the end of chapter 2, the very last verse. It says that they were not ashamed. Adam and Eve knew what it was like to be married in a world that didn't have sin. We don't know what that's like. Adam and Eve knew what it was like to be married to someone who was not sinful. We don't know what that was like. And that's why Bible scholars believe Adam and Eve had this really beautiful, godly, biblical marriage. 
And the Bible doesn't specifically say that, but I, I believe it. I think they had a beautiful marriage that was full of peace and harmony and love. I mean, after all, there were no in-laws, right? I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Got to laugh a little bit, friends. But they did. They had a beautiful marriage, right? Until you get to the next chapter. Genesis chapter 3. And Adam and Eve come and they eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And all of a sudden, listen, don't miss this. All of a sudden, sin enters the world and it breaks everything. We live in a broken world that has earthquakes like we're seeing in Turkey. We live in a fallen society where people commit crimes and there's violence. And this brokenness also impacts our marriage and it impacts the way we think about marriage. And so first and foremost, sin taints our view of marriage. And that leads me to my second point about us. And here's point number two. None of us has the right to judge one another for their past. Last time I checked, friends, we are all sinners, including myself. I shared my story with you a few weeks ago. And I think when you come to a sermon like this, if you've not been divorced, if you're not remarried, or you've never struggled with marriage, it's easy for us to hear God's word and then justify ourselves in our hearts. It's easy for pride to well up and for us to look down our noses at other people. And can I remind you, friends... John chapter 8, when they bring the woman caught in adultery, they take the woman caught in adultery to Jesus and they say, what should we do with this woman? And the Old Testament says to stone her. That's how seriously God takes marriage. That's how seriously God takes adultery. And so the religious leaders, they're trying to trap Jesus. They're trying to get him to sign off on the death penalty for this woman. And instead, he says, he who is without sin cast the first stone. Can I remind you, friends, this morning, we're going to perhaps talk about an area where you might know someone else has sin, but you don't have a stone to cast. I don't have a stone to cast. And if you're here this morning and we're going to be talking about something that's in your past, can I just say this? I know that this is intensely personal for you. In the last couple of weeks, I've had I've had many of you come to me and share your stories, knowing that we were going to talk about this. Some of you have shared stories of marital unfaithfulness and how that has impacted your life. Some of you have shared stories of abuse in marriage. Some of you are wrestling through difficulty in your marriages right now. And you're considering, is this divorce an option? Is divorce something I could consider? It doesn't seem like we're able to work this out. And friends, I want you to know, I. I've been praying for you and for me all week as we prepare for this because I don't want to just take this word and give you the right answers. I want, to, I want to show you how this does impact your life. But we don't have the right to judge others just because they sin differently than we do. Now let me give you a reality or two about God. So here's the first thing we know about God from the word. God's ways are always best. Even if they don't make sense, friends. God's ways are always best, even if they don't make sense. Listen, God is all wise, right? God is all good. God is infinitely loving. Friends, in other words, if you and I knew what God knows, if you and I had the character that God has, we would set up marriage, divorce, and remarriage exactly the same way God has set it up in his word. We would come to the same exact conclusions that we're about to see today. God's ways are always best, even if they don't make sense to us. I mean, think about, for example, the cross. Think about God's plan to redeem fallen humanity. Well, I'm going to take my son and have him take on human flesh and be born to a lower middle class family in a manger, in a stable. And that little baby's going to grow up live a perfect life, and die on a cross as if you were a hardened criminal. That doesn't make any sense, friends. That's not what you or I would come up with here. And yet, God's way was best. And friends, listen, what we're about to see may not be what you would come up with, but can I remind you, you will not come up with something better than God on any topic, especially this one. So God's ways are always best. And number two, I've already referenced this, 
The second thing you can know is that if you are a Christian, if you are in Christ, there is no condemnation for you, regardless of how you may have sinned in your past. There is no condemnation for you, regardless of how you've sinned in your past. Whether it's these topics or a whole different topic, friends, there is no condemnation in Christ. There's forgiveness for all of us. Yet, we also want to be clear about what the Bible says. So, I want to share with you one key thought in our passage that undergirds, undergirds the rest of what we're going to see. And it starts in verse 17. So look with me in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 17. Paul says this, Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this manner, let him walk. Now jump down with me to verse 20. He says something similar. Each man must remain in that condition in which he was called. Now look at verse 24. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. This is something Paul hits on over and over again. And here's really what's happening. If you look at verse 1 of the chapter, what you're going to see is Paul says, let me, let me respond to you about the things that you wrote me about. In other words, what's happened here is the Corinthians actually had questions on these subjects. And so if you're here this morning and you have questions about these subjects, you're in good company. We've been talking about it for centuries, okay? And Paul's going to write them, and he's going to answer their questions about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. But first, he's going to hit on what's behind their questions. Because a lot of times, listen, a lot of times when we want to know answers to these questions, what we're really wanting to know is, can I change my circumstances and God still be okay with me? And I want you to see this. Paul, Paul says this, first and foremost. Changing your circumstances in order to fill a void in your life is not necessarily going to make things better. And so singles, if your greatest desire is a spouse and you think having a spouse will make everything better for you, can I give you a news flash? Married, married people, help me out here. It's not going to fill the void in your life. Listen, if you're married and you think changing your circumstances by getting divorced is suddenly going to fill a void in your life, if I just get rid of that person, if I make a change in my circumstances, that'll make everything all better. Friends, that's not necessarily true. Those of us that have walked through divorce know that. And so what Paul's saying is, don't go looking for an opportunity to change your circumstances. Look for God to use you and to minister to you in the circumstances you're in. I'm not saying you can't change your circumstances. Paul will even say that. But we're not coming to this looking for a change in our relationship status on Facebook to ch change everything about our lives and suddenly give us meaning. No, instead, Paul says, listen, it's, it's not about your relationship status, it's about your relationship with God, and how God can sanctify you and use you where you are. So, with that in mind, let me start by talking to those in the room who are single. Here's a couple of notes for singles based on this passage, if you look with me in verses 8 and 9. But I say to the unmarried and to widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So singles in the room, let me give you two thoughts based on the authority of God's word. First and foremost, see singleness as a good gift. See singleness as a good gift. The world we live in tells you that if you're here and you're single and you've never been married, that maybe something's wrong with you. And people even ask you questions, right? Do you have your eye on somebody? Have you been on any dates lately? And those are innocent questions, but what's really behind them is the thought that, well, you're single, so you should be looking for someone to marry. Because that'll make your life better. So you should have your eye on somebody, or you should be going on dates. And friends, can I just remind us? The savior of the world was a single man. Jesus. He was single as a man, into his 30s. And Jesus lived a perfectly fulfilled life. He lived an abundant life. And so singles, listen, can I tell you something? If you're here, it's okay to be single. In fact, Paul actually says, I wish you would be. And Paul was a single man. He was single his entire life, all the way up to his death when he was around 60 years old. 
And Paul lived a great and a godly and a fulfilled life. You don't need a spouse to make you happy. Now, if you have a desire for a spouse, certainly feel free to pray to God for that. Say, God, in your timing, will you please give me someone to share life with and to love you with? However, instead of just looking to change your circumstances, can I also encourage you, friends, if you're single, to pray, God, will you help use me where I'm at right now in my singleness? Don't give me a desire to run from my singleness. Give me a desire to use my singleness for your glory, because that's what Paul gets at later in chapter 7. Take a look with me in verse 32. I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife, and his interests are divided. So here's the second thing you can write down, singles. Use your singleness to be single-minded about Jesus. Use your singleness to be single-minded about Jesus. Because the reality is, the married people in the room will understand this, if you're married, you have a good tension in your life between pleasing God and also spending time with the spouse, right? I mean, think about even this upcoming Saturday. This Saturday, I'm going to a men's conference. There's, there's a lot of me that is very excited about this men's conference. I'm excited to worship with people. I'm excited to meet new friends. I'm excited to grow in the Lord. But I'm also going to miss my girls. There's a part of me that will want to be home rolling around on the living room floor, tickling my daughter and giggling and dancing to Let It Go from Frozen, right? There's a tension there, okay? And, and listen, every married person has that tension. How do you use your time to glorify God and also give the time and attention needed to your spouse or your children? But single people, listen, you have a blessing, a good gift here in that you are not divided in your interests. Be single-minded about focusing on Jesus so that you can live your life in fullness for his glory. That's a huge blessing, friends. You have the opportunity to leverage your life and your time in a massive way for God's glory. So don't, don't neglect your singleness. Look at it as a good gift and see how God may want to use you. Now, let's talk for a minute to the married people in the room. Married people, we talked a couple of weeks ago, but I do want to give you verses 10 and 11. So read with me. But to the married, I give instructions. Not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband, but if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and that the husband should not divorce his wife. Now, Paul is not saying that you can never divorce for any reason. We're going to look at that in a minute. But here's what he is saying, and this is a, this is a note for everybody in the room who's married. Friends, we live in a broken world, so fight for your marriage. Fight for for your marriage. If you don't fight for your marriage, you might lose to someone who's fighting to rip your marriage apart. The enemy prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And he has been devouring marriages since the beginning of time. He devoured the first marriage in many ways. And so friends, let me remind you, fight for your marriage. And you might be sitting here thinking, Ben, I, it doesn't look very hopeful. Keep fighting. Let me encourage you. Keep fighting for your marriage. This is worth fighting for. If God designed it, and if this is a picture of Jesus, it's worth fighting for. Does Jesus fight for his people? Yes, friends. And if we want to give the world a clear picture, then we need to keep fighting for our marriages also. So let me encourage you, husbands, lead spiritually. Pray for your wives. Study the Bible with your wives, or at least talk about the Bible with your wives. Go on a date night. Get someone to watch your kids. Wives, let me encourage you. Don't gossip about your husband or put him down in front of him or behind his back. Let me encourage you. Try to paint a picture of how the church is to follow Jesus and fight for your marriage because it matters. If you're in a marriage, fight for it. But at the same time, we do also know that there are divorces in our world and in Scripture. So what about divorce? What does the Bible say about divorce? Well, divorce is permitted in Scripture for two reasons. Let me give you the first one. You can write this down. The first reason 
that Jesus allows for divorce is actually mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount, and it's the case of adultery or marital unfaithfulness. And friends, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that one. I, I think we all get the picture there, right? It's a, it's a breaking of the covenant. And so God says, hey, I, I'm not commanding you to divorce, but you are permitted to divorce in that case. And so that's the first reason. The second reason is actually taught here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Start in verse 14 with me. Actually, sorry, verse 13. A woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Yet if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? So here's the picture here. Let me just explain it to us briefly. We've, we've talked about adultery as reason number one. Reason number two you could write down is what we call abandonment. Abandonment. And here's the picture. Let's say you have one spouse who's a Christian, and the other spouse is not a Christian. And the spouse who is not a Christian says, I want out of this marriage. I don't want to be married to someone who follows Jesus. You take this too seriously. You're too radical. You're, you're obsessed with going to church and spending time in the Bible. I want out of this marriage. In those cases, the Bible says the Christian is allowed to let them leave. You're allowed to let them go. You don't have to force somebody to stay married to you because you can see here at the end of verse 15, God has called us to peace. Above all, God wants us to live at peace with all men. And if peace means allowing someone else to walk out of the home, God says you can allow them to walk out of the home. It's a Christian and a non-Christian, and the non-Christian looks to leave. Now, those are the two examples given in the Bible, but in our culture, there's a whole lot more examples, right? Some of them are very frivolous, right? We just chalk a lot of our divorces up to this term that we use called irreconcilable differences. And can, can I just remind you, friends, every one of us has irreconcilable differences, okay? Marriage is hard. I mean, it's just like, it's just like the story of the guy, maybe you've heard this one. It's just like the story of the guy who tried to give his wife advice. Ladies, have you ever had your husband try to give you advice at a time when he didn't want it? Yeah, well, this guy did that, okay? His wife was having a hard day, and she was beating herself up about some past mistakes. And he says, sweetheart, you need to stop beating yourself up. Everybody makes mistakes. They happen. You know, and you just, what matters is just get up, you know? Get, get back in the saddle. Learn from your mistakes. Try harder and, and do smarter next time. What you need to learn, honey, is not to run from mistakes. You need to learn to actually embrace your mistakes. And his wife just got this really choked up look on her face, and he thought, uh-oh, did I make a mistake here? But then she walked up and gave him a big hug. Yeah. And he thought to himself, man, I'm doing good. I just, I just saved the day. I gave her wonderful advice, and she is so thankful for me. She gave me a big hug. But then the hug kept going. It was a long hug. Long enough that he said, honey, what, what are we doing here? And she said, well, I'm embracing my number one mistake. That's you. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. That's a bad one, friends. Now, marriage is hard, right? All of us have irreconcilable differences in a sense. But, listen, can I remind you, friends, did we have irreconcilable differences with God? And did Jesus reconcile those differences? So can Jesus reconcile your differences with your spouse? Absolutely. Absolutely he can. So don't cheapen marriage by saying, well, I just didn't get along. In fact, that's what the people of Jesus' day did. I told you a couple of weeks ago, men were allowed to divorce their wives if they burned dinner, if they overcooked the food, or if she was what's considered a noisy or obnoxious woman. I mean, God love her. I had Dana Khan come up to me after church last week and said, I would have struck out on both of those accounts, right? He said, if I was married to one of those men back then, I would have been gone. And I didn't even tell you about all of them. You could divorce your wife in that day if you simply had a conversation, if, or if she had a conversation with another man for any reason, even if it was to plan your birthday party. If you saw your wife talking to another man, 
you could end the marriage. You could also divorce your wife back then if she did a twirl in public. Yeah, yeah, isn't that weird? So ladies, you're wearing your nice Easter dress, it's a nice day, and you decide to do a little, you know, a little twirl in public, you could, boom, the man could say, nope, there will be no fun in this marriage, right? You're out. They divorce for, for, for ridiculous reasons, and friends, we do the same thing. We laugh at them, but do we do much better in our culture? We don't. Now, I do want to talk about two in particular that the Bible does not specifically hit on. And some of you have brought them to my attention, and I want to gently walk us through the word here. What about a case of abuse? So, Ben, are you saying that because the Bible only mentions adultery and abandonment, that if my spouse is physically or mentally or emotionally or verbally abusing me, then I have to stay in the marriage? And what about, in addition to that, the case of addictions? Ben, my spouse has a gambling addiction and has racked up a lot of debt in our marriage. They're sabotaging our home. My spouse has a, an addiction to swiping their credit card. And we have credit card debt everywhere, and it's ruining our, our lives. It's taking the hope and a future away from our kids in many ways. What about those two scenarios? Well, let me humbly encourage you. While the Bible doesn't specifically say anything about those scenarios, I think we can walk through the Bible and see what God would say about those scenarios. And here's where I think we would go. First of all, we would want to determine, is that spouse a Christian or not a Christian? If they're not a Christian, I think what we just looked at with abandonment probably applies. They're sabotaging the marriage to the point that they're acting as if they don't want to be married to you either through their abuse or through their addictive, addictive behavior that they're unwilling to change. And I think in situations like that, with godly counsel, in situations like that, there's room to at least have a conversation about, hey, is this individual acting as if they no longer want to be married, as if they don't want to be in this situation anymore? So where I would typically recommend you start is not with divorce, but with figuring out if the individual is a believer or not. You can also take the route of separation, right? Just because the Bible doesn't mention divorce in these situations doesn't mean the Bible would not recommend separation. In fact, in a few of situations like that I have in the past recommended, especially in the case of abuse, I have recommended to some wives, especially if they also have children, please get out of the home. If you're in danger in your home, leave your home. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about the state of the marriage later, but God, God would want you to get to safety first and foremost. Amen? Amen. And so, friends, if you're in a, in a difficult situation, call me. Let me know. Call, call the authorities. Call someone you trust, but get out of that situation, and we'll deal with the marriage later. Now, if the person is a Christian, then we have a whole different conversation, because while we'll deal with the marriage, we also need to talk about church discipline at that point. And at that point, we need to have a whole other set of conversations about why someone who claims to be a follower of Christ is acting in an abusive or an addictive way. And in those situations as well, typically what I do is I recommend separation with the purpose of calling the Christian to repentance. And if they repent, in time, we pray for reconciliation. In fact, that's the point of separation in the Bible. In our culture, we treat separation as a stepping stone to divorce. In the Bible, it's different. Separation is a stepping stone to waking everybody up and so that we can reconcile. Okay? It's, it's, it's a, it's a wake-up call. And so in many of those cases, I recommend separation at first, and then we'll deal with the case-by-cases a little bit later on. Because the reality, friends, is, and you know this as well as I do, everybody's situation is different. And we can't just broad brush answers here. But at the very least, I think in situations of abuse or addiction, it is wise to carefully consider, should there be a separation? Now, let me get to the last one here, very briefly, and it's the concept of remarriage. After a divorce, is it ever okay to remarry? Well, there's really two opinions here. There's two thoughts on this subject. One thought, a lot of people believe, the answer to that question is no. That in the Bible, 
there is never grounds for remarriage under any circumstances whatsoever unless the former spouse has died. And let me give you a few verses to write down. This is kind of an option number one, if you will. You can write down Luke chapter 16, verse 18. Jesus is teaching and he says this, Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries one who's, who is divorced also commits adultery. And so that seems pretty clear. You can also write down Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. I'll let you look that up later on your own time. And you also see this potentially in our passage. Look at verses 10 and 11. But to the married I give instructions, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. But, notice this here, if she does leave, she must remain unmarried, or else be reconciled to her husband, and that the husband should not divorce her wife. So the idea here is, if there is a divorce that happens, the spouses that are divorced, they should not remarry just in case, by God's grace, a heart change and repentance happens, and they want to be reconciled, okay? So that's the first camp, that no divorce under any circumstances whatsoever. There's a lot of people, however, that would disagree with that. There are many who would say that remarriage is allowed, but only for the innocent spouse. Okay? So let me give you a few verses here. You can, you can write down Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. We are going to look at these for sake of time. Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4. Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. That's the passage we've looked at in the Sermon on the Mount. And we can also look at verse 15 of our passage. Yet, if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases. A lot of people believe that that word bondage means you're no longer held to the marriage and you're free to remarry. Okay? That's, that's the idea. Now, here's, here's the reality. This is not like going to a restaurant where you get a menu and you just pick the one you like best. Okay? These are, these are two camps, if you will. These are two viewpoints, if you will. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out what would, what would God humbly lead us in here. So the question is, which one is right? And I've got three words to answer that for you. Are you ready? I'm not sure. I'm going to be honest, friends. I'm not sure. And listen, I will be very clear with you. Where the Bible's clear... Everything we've talked about up to remarriage, the Bible is very clear about, and I'm going to be dogmatic on those things. But when we come to this one, you can make a good biblical argument for allowing remarriage and a good biblical argument for not allowing remarriage. I mean, just take Deuteronomy 24. I'll let you look it up later. But, G but Moses writes, if a man divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Well... The purpose of that certificate was so that if another man wanted to marry her, he was allowed to. So the purpose of that certificate was for remarriage. It seems like God may be okay with remarriage. But then you get to Luke 16, 18, and God says, everyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So which one is it? And people have debated this for a long time. So here's where I would humbly encourage us. And listen, if, if you've tuned out for a minute... Let me have you dial back in here, because this is going to apply not just to divorce and remarriage, this is going to apply to a lot of subjects, okay? I think we need to come to this particular conversation with humility, and we need to think about it much the same way we think about alcohol in the church. Okay, now I'm going to open up a can of worms here, and I know that, but follow with me. Is it okay to touch alcohol or not? Yes. Well, it depends. <laughs> It depends. You can make a biblical argument for both, right? If you go through the Bible, friends, I've actually done this, you can come up with almost a hundred different warnings in the Bible about alcohol. When the Bible talks about alcohol, it almost always does it in a negative sense. It's almost always warning us about the dangers of drunkenness and alcohol controlling us. That's why Paul says, don't be filled with wine, be filled with the Spirit. Proverbs talks about this all the time. Wine is a mocker. It compares alcohol to a snake and its venom. So the Bible is very clear. Alcohol is not to be toyed around with. It's not to be messed with. But 
Jesus' very first miracle was turning water into wine. And Paul writes to Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach. The reality is, you can make a biblical argument for both sides of that, and the Bible in many ways leaves it up to your conviction. You come to a conviction on this. It's the same thing, the last passage I'll have you write down is Romans 14, the whole chapter. If you look at one passage that I've given you, look at Romans 14. It talks about whether it was okay to eat meat. And Paul says this, don't cause your brother to stumble, but he also says, let everyone be convinced in his own mind because we'll all give an account to God. Or in other words, here's what Paul teaches. Everybody's got to come to their own conclusions with the conscience God has given you. And so, let me, let me bring it back to the alcohol discussion for a second. There are some people in our church who are okay with alcohol in moderation. We're all clear drunkenness is sin. But there are some people in our church who don't mind a glass of wine with dinner. And before God, I can say I'm okay with that. I don't, I'm not drinking, but I can say I'm okay with you in moderation according to Scripture, enjoying it as a gift. However, there are many of us also who would say, no, I don't want to touch the stuff because of all the warnings in the Bible. And you know what? Before God, I'm okay with that too. Praise God for that. The point is, be convinced, have your conscience, and don't violate your conscience. And don't cause your brother or sister to stumble in the way that you exercise your freedom in Christ. And the same thing I would say applies to this remarriage conversation. Some of us in the room, hear me here. If you're, if you're taking notes, let me have your eyes up here. Some of us in this room are never okay with remarriage. Either because you've studied it in the Word or because you've seen how it plays out in culture. You've, you've seen it in your own family. Some of us are never okay with remarriage, and if that's your conviction, I praise God for that. I really do. Some of us in this room are okay with remarriage for the innocent party, and by God's grace, I praise God for that too. Let each one be convinced in their own mind. What we're not going to do, friends, is we're not going to judge one another. And what we're not going to do is we're not going to look down our noses at somebody who might think differently about a subject than we do if their stance is also biblical. You can make a biblical argument for both things. So I know some of you are going to ask me, and I'm just going to answer the question, what do I think? Well, let me give you my humble guess, and this is just a guess. My humble conviction on the matter is I would side with option A. My humble belief a lot of people would disagree with me. In fact, I'm in the vast minority here. Most of my professors at the seminary would disagree with me. Almost every member of my own family disagrees with me, minus Kara. I'm in the vast minority, but I would, I would humbly argue that God never allows for divorce in his work. You can argue against me and make a great argument against me, and that's why while I'm convinced of that, I hold it very loosely, and I do not judge anyone who does get remarried according to biblical grounds. And so if you're here and you're remarried, can I just tell you, I love you. I do not judge you in any way, even though I would not personally do that. And I love you enough, I'm going to fight for your marriage as hard as you will. I want you to have the best marriage you can possibly have. I want you to glorify God in your marriage. And so as your pastor, if you're here and you're remarried, don't feel like we have a problem because we don't. I hold this very, very loosely and I will fight for you against the enemy who's fighting against you. Amen? We're on the same team. Now, one of the things that I do personally, this is how I live out my conviction, is when someone comes to me and asks me to marry them, one of the first questions I typically ask is, have you or the person you intend to marry been divorced? And if they have been divorced, I say, look, I love you and I will support you and I will fight for your marriage, but it's probably best if I don't do the ceremony because I don't want to be a stain on your big day. I don't want to do that. And so if you're here and you are divorce or you're intending to marry someone who is divorced, I don't say that to you, again, to judge you or to be mean or to offend in any way. I love you and I want to help you have a great marriage. But I also have to be honest with my own conscience before God. And I don't want to violate my conscience before God because I give an account for the way that I conduct myself just like you do in your life, even if you come to different conclusions that could also be biblical. Does that make sense? And so friends, listen, we love one another, we fight for every marriage in this church. 
We fight for every marriage that's going to happen in this church. We don't talk about one another behind our backs. We don't judge one another. We don't look down our noses because there's only one person who's been in a perfect marriage. It's Jesus. And friends, we're all going to be a part of that marriage in eternity. That's the one we're ultimately living to please. That's the one we're ultimately living to emulate is in eternity, we will get to be a part of a beautiful marriage between Jesus and his bride, the church. And I can't wait for that because then we won't have to have any of these talks. Amen. In the meantime, it's messy. But can I tell you this, friends? I love you. I want God's best for you. I want you to look at these passages on your own. Come to your own conclusion. Be convinced in your own mind. And let's live to exalt marriage as a picture of the gospel. Amen? Point people to Jesus with your life. Whether you're single, married, divorced, or remarried, all of us can point people to Jesus. Amen? Will you pray with me? Father, we come before you again. I just thank you for your word. I thank you for the fact that we don't we don't have to guess at many of these situations. God, you have you have given us your word clearly. And yet, God, I know that because of our sin nature. We don't often see things clearly that you have explained to us clearly. So God, while I know that your word is clear on remarriage, we we honestly just can't figure it out, God. There's been confusion and debate and conflict about this topic for centuries. And the reality is we can't see it clearly because we've allowed sin into our hearts. And so help us, God. Guide us according to the convictions that you give us. Father, may we, may we conduct ourselves in love, in all things. I pray for the singles in the room that they would point people to Jesus in their singleness, that they, would, that they would be able to devote their time to serving you in a great way. For those who are married, God, I pray that we would fight for our marriages against the enemy who's fighting us. For those who are divorced, Father, I just pray that you would give them grace. Divorce is messy, it's painful, and it's hard, but you provide healing and comfort where needed. God, for those who are remarried, I thank you for their marriages, and I thank you for the way that you have brought them together with somebody. I pray that you would exalt Jesus in marriages all across this room. God, I pray that you would exalt marriages all across this room, and that you would bring us into greater unity as a result of this time in the Word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.